What up? This is A Track, and you're watching Hot New Hip Hop. Hi, my name is A Track. First and foremost, I'm a DJ, um, and stemming from that, I have other activities that I do.、Um, I run Fool's Gold Records, which is on its 11th year now. Fool's Gold itself is a record label, an events company, and a retail brand. And I also organize the Goldie Awards, which is a DJ battle. I started DJing so young, you know. I, I started messing around with scratching when I was 13. Wow. You know, living in Montreal, literally just in my parents' basement, teaching myself how to scratch. You know, pre YouTube, pre pre any of that, just. Decoding this this language of sound, right? And、um, so back then, I don't think I knew it would be a long-term career or even what it would be. I just knew I loved it. I just knew I was hooked to it, and that every day I would come come straight home from school and practice for as many hours as I could. And it's funny because、um, I was moving、uh, like two three years ago, and I was going through boxes, and I started I saw some old interviews. That I did, you know. By the time I was 15, I was world champion, basically. So I started getting some press attention、um, from these DJ battles that I was winning. And yeah, I have these interviews that I did when I was 14, 15, and they're like, "What do you want to do when you grow up?" kind of thing, or like, "Where do you see yourself in five years or ten years?" And I wasn't sure if I was going to DJ my whole life, you know. When I was, I'm 36 now, so this is a while ago. When I was 14,、um, I would just be like, you know, I'd like to be. A pediatrician, <laughs> and we'll see how long this DJing thing lasts. And then I ended up studying physics in college and and whatever else.、Um, you know, for I, I I started taking DJing very seriously as I was a high school student. And for the first couple of years of that music career, that sort of double life between going to school and DJing was actually a, a balance that worked for me. I enjoyed having two halves to my life.、Um, I liked the way that that worked with my creativity. I liked the fact that one part of my brain was active during certain hours of the day, and another part of my brain was active during other hours.、Um, I think there's just something about that that fits my my not only my personality but the way that my mind works.、Um, I don't think I do well if I just do only one thing. So I would be you know be in school part of the day, and then I knew I had X amount of hours. From the moment I got home until dinner time, and then after dinner I had to do homework. So I had to cram my practice time then, and it kind of forced me to come up with ideas and just you know use that time wisely. And、um, between high school and college, I tried taking a sabbatical year from from school, and I only DJed, and it was the year where I was the least productive in my life, I think. And that's when I figured out that I I I sort of thrive when I have. At least two, three things on my plate.、Um, but to, to go back to your question, yeah, I don't think I knew that it would be my long, long-term career. Let alone, I don't think I knew that I would run one or multiple businesses down the line. You know, like sometimes I look at the Fool's Gold shop. We have a, a brick-and-mortar store in Brooklyn, and I'm like, I never thought when I was, you know, scratching Bismarck Key Records as a teenager that I would have a retail store. You know, sometimes I'm playing. Electronic music festivals in Europe and playing techno in my sets, and I was a hip hop kid. You know, I grew up on DJ Premier beats. I didn't think I'd be playing that either. But I think, you know, giving myself new challenges every couple of years and like, you know, adding adding elements and dimension to what I do is what's kept this exciting and interesting for me over the years. I've never felt bored, but I think I don't allow myself to feel bored because every few years I just add something to, you know, this sort of. Uh, the collage that is, you know, the A Track Enterprise. It's like this quilt that there's always things that get added to it.、Um, but I think, you know, there's there's kind of a pivotal period when I look back where, like, you know, the first almost ten years of my music career were pretty straightforward, like turntablism and hip hop DJing. You know, it went from learning how to scratch to entering battles and winning battles to winning as many battles as I could to. You know, coasting off of that for a, a little while, and then you know, meeting Kanye, working with him,、uh, starting in '04, shortly after college dropout, and that period of like the mid 2000s, 2004, 5, 6. I feel like there's a lot of shifts that happen at that point in time, as much in the scene as in the way that people consumed music and culture and media, as even just certain growths for me. Personally, as an individual, 
that ended up defining my approach to my career in the long term. But essentially, you know, these are the years where MySpace was really kind of like the Petri dish of everything. And um, the fact that, you know, and, and I started blogging also, and I wasn't even calling it blogs, but I would call it like a travel journal or something. Uh, but, you know, writing down these sort of stories and narratives about my travels and who I encounter and how different my shows are. And at the same time, uh, through the fact that I had to have images, visuals to post on MySpace about what my next tour was and a mixtape I just made and, and what have you, uh, I started taking, you know, the aesthetic and, uh, side of things more seriously and like just being more concerned with having a logo and a style of graphics that's consistent and making sure, you know, the cover art looks like the tour flyer and that kind of thing. That sort of like woke up my marketing brain in a sense. That ignited the marketing side of like, hey, let's make this look at, look like a thing. And like it tapped into the music fan in me that always obsessed over, you know, uh, the artwork of records that I loved. Or even like looking, looking at uh, looking at the full package and looking at the legacy of labels that I loved and um, certain artists that would you know eventually have their own label and you know their own magazines. You know Beastie Boys who had Grand Royal as a magazine and 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 the label to sign other artists too and that kind of thing. And it it made me start looking at my own projects that way. I think that period in time, combined with the fact that like working with Kanye made me feel like I had to define myself even more because I was standing next to the sun, basically. Like, I could just get eclipsed very easily. Like, it made me feel like, all right, I'm not going to go from being, you know, record-breaking multiple-time world champion to someone's DJ. No, just, you know, I, it was never disrespecting the Kanye, and he respected that, too. It just made me feel like, all right, let me just get my shit tight and make sure that what 8-Track stands for is very defined to people, too, so that it becomes an interesting package and not just suddenly hiding behind someone. So all those things that happened in that period of like 04, 05, 06 um, made me really think about uh, marketing myself more. And what I learned for myself, I eventually applied to my team, you know, because then shortly after that, you know, I, I, I went and started Fool's Gold and went even further with that. And um, yeah, even during that same time, doing those tours, balancing 8-track tours and Kanye tours, um, I was coming to New York to visit a lot. I was still living in Montreal. Um, and I would just go downtown and find these shops that were making like cool t-shirts that I liked and like, you know, all over hoodies and those kinds of things and getting, you know, meeting some of the people designing this clothes who are people around the same age as me who grew up listening to music like I did and just being like, hey, why don't we make a t-shirt? You know, that whole collab culture came up very organically for me. Um, so those seeds that were planted in those years, that led to this sort of like multi-hyphenate version of the DJ. Like that, that didn't really exist before in a sense. You know, up until those years, I think uh, a DJ was a DJ, right? And then certain DJs also produced, but it kind of, it still remains this sort of like uh, person in the attic that just digs for records and perfects their craft and then goes out and rocks the party, which is the core of what I love. But I think the shift that happened at, at this time that I'm describing right now is also made me think, okay, I'm going to stay that person, but I'm also going to write about what I do. And I'm also going to work with people whose aesthetics I like and create an image around what it is. And, you know, this is the kind of clothes I'm going to be recognized as. Like, this is my outfit. I'm Batman. I wear this thing every day. Like, and just make it all recognizable and, um, and you know, just kind of fine craft the definition of, of all of it. We had a couple little scratch routines on, uh, on, uh, on the Kanye records where, where I had my scratch parts that, you know, it was always a question of finding something that, that um, actually added to the song. Like... I learned a lot doing those shows, not because Ye or anyone ever sat me down and taught me a lesson or whatever. It was through experience. You know, I come from an extremely, um, an extremely underground place in hip hop that is also a sort of closed circuit. You know, the turntable is seen in the late 90s and early 2000s. I was performing for people who already knew and understood my craft. You know what I mean? So I never had to 
in those early years, I didn't have to sort of walk the audience through what I was about to do. If I was doing a very technically elaborate beat juggle or something, the audience knew what a beat juggle was in the first place, and they'd already probably seen the executioners and this person and that person. So they were like, oh, this is a tracks take on a thing I already know. And then when I started working with Ye, and I'd be performing at the VH1 Awards or the, the Grammys or whatever else, or our first tour was opening for Usher, performing for Usher fans, who certainly didn't know what scratching on vinyl was, it made me think like, oh, I need to contextualize this. And that, too, that really opened a whole other part of my brain. And it's funny because I feel like ever since then, and also the more I started producing my own music, it's like I had to teach myself to produce my turntablism. You know what I mean? Because it's like, it's literally, I, I had to learn how to present it. And I never wanted to dilute it. So it's just figuring out ways to present what I do with my skill set with just a little bit more context, as opposed to just diving straight in, crazy fast shit, where people are just like, I don't even know what he's doing right now. It's subtle little things and little choices, choosing the right song, knowing what to do, where and when, and how to dose it, what quantity, um, that's production. The Goldie Awards has been really fulfilling for me personally. Last year was the first year, and just, you know, it took us two years to even get it off the ground, um, but, there's a big part of that where for me personally, it felt like I was able to tie a big loop in my life and go full 360 by going back to the type of platform that, that gave me my name, right? Because I got known in 97 when I was the youngest ever world champ. That put me on the map and allowed me to get gigs for years. I was able to create a platform that can do that thing for today's DJs but also using a lot of the know-how on all kinds of things that I accumulated in the meantime, right? Because 10 years ago when I started Fool's Gold, it was a little bit hard to put turntablism in front of people's faces in certain ways. I would do it myself, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily have some of the infrastructure needed to fully take as many people as I wanted through the door. So I, I kind of went forward by myself at first to try and open more doors and set up, a, you know, put a few pieces in place. And by running Fool's Gold, which also includes an events branch, Fool's Gold Day Off that's existed since 2010, learning and running Fool's Gold Day Off taught me how to um, curate a lineup and how to, how to um, influence the kind of audience that you want to bring to your event too, with all kinds of decisions from what the artwork looks like, to who's also on the lineup, you know, what all these little connotations bring to someone's mind when they see a flyer and they think, I want to see this. And like opening new people's curiosity to something they haven't seen before. I used a lot of that know-how to start the Goldie Awards. Because a big part of the, of the mission statement for the Goldie Awards was to bring new blood and a sort of feeling of refreshment and reinvention to turntablism and, 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 and battles. I didn't want to draw only the same people who go to other ba existing battles because those have been sort of struggling to get the attendance that we all want. I wanted to figure out a way to combine that base with people who, are, who go to a Fool's Gold show and will tell me that they first saw a Travis Scott or an ASAP Rocky on our stage. Like people who come to Fool's Gold for discovery and like all the cool downtown kids who have the coolest Instagram pages or the person who's going to be, who's just put out a new record that's so dope that I'm going to put it on the Fool's Gold stage next year. Also, like all that sort, that community, I wanted to bring that community to, to the Goldie Awards and show them skillful DJing for them to be like, yo, I love this, even though they hadn't seen it in that format before. So that was, to me, that was a big part of the mission and the achievement of the Goldie Awards even last year and that we're bringing back this year is the way that I really tried to combine, you know, all these different branches and lessons and elements of what I've done in the last 20 years and put it on one stage. I had another label before Fool's Gold. Audio Research was literally just my brother and I um, back in Montreal. Uh, we started that label the same year that I won my first DMC battle, so in 97. And that was, that was born in in the spirit and in the boom of the late 90s indie hip-hop revival. And that's the scene that really raised me. Fat Beats, you know, 
Rockus Records. Audio Research, the first label that my brother and I had that I was telling you about, um, literally we would, you know, we got a, we parlayed our way into a distribution deal with Fat Beats. We would press vinyl in Canada, send it over to Fat Beats, and they would get it to record shops around the world. And that's amazing, because to this day, I'll go to like Germany and someone will bring me a 12 inch of something that I pressed up when I was 16 and be like, hey, can you sign this? And I'm like, yo, this is 20 years ago. But that planted so many seeds and that was such a community, such an organic grassroots community that had the same values and the same attachment to certain things that were holy to us. Um, you know, people hold on to that their whole lives. So everything I've done during the rest of my career was based on those kinds of values. And I know the value of something that's homegrown. And, you know, I, I could go and perform a festival in front of 50,000 people one day, but I'm just as excited to build something with my bare hands, with my friends, and continue to create that feeling that that German fan had, had when he bought our 12 inch 20 years ago. Like people know when something is built with that personal passion. Uh, disputed, disputed story for the name, it's funny. But essentially, so Fool's Gold is really, um, at, the, at the core of it, it's a, it's a, it's, um, you know, a partnership between myself and my friend Nick Catchdubs. Catchdubs is a DJ from New York. And, you know, he and I became friends around that, that period that I was talking about earlier, around 06, when, you know, uh, blogs became prominent and, you know, you could just download MP3s of some, some type of music that you hadn't heard about and share it with friends. We were friends on iChat. You would send me like some new hyphy record that I didn't know. And I was like, oh wow, the bass got a new sound. And we would just build on that kind of stuff. And, you know, he's someone that's just endlessly curious and full of so much knowledge. And then I go and meet so many people and I dig some stuff up my own way too. And when we combine our brains, there's just a lot of ideas that go constantly. And Fool's Gold was born from that. And um, uh, long story short, we were brainstorming for names and we, would and we decided to start Fool's Gold during the sort of Christmas and New Year's holiday, you know, end of 06 into top of 07. So I remember like that Christmas and New Year's break just sending each other emails with lists of like 20 names each. Like, here's, here's what I got. And just going each other's list, over each other's list and being like, ah, I'm not sure, I like this one, I don't like that one. And um, at the time, I was also dating uh, a rapper uh, called Kid Sister from Chicago, who was one of the first artists on the label too. And so she was, yes, she, she was one of our first artists, but she and I would always brainstorm on stuff too. Uh, she claimed that she came up with the name. I will say, sure, I thought I came up with it, but I will, you know, do the Cavalier thing and say she probably came up with it. I just remember that we had a long ass list. I don't, none, no one, none of us remembers who put what name where. Uh, you know, the funny thing is too, is that at the time, I really liked coming up with names for stuff. And a lot of my favorite names um, were sort of absurd. And if you think about duck sauce and some of my other projects like none of it really means anything it just sounds like a thing yeah. Yeah, it sounds like it exists but you don't know what it means um, and uh, I uh, Ye was a fan of my sort of absurd humor at times and when I couldn't decide between two three things sometimes back then I would text them and be like hey uh, I gotta name a tour or I gotta name a label, I gotta do this. What do you think, A, B, or C? And then he would tell me his thing. And I remember he was the tiebreaker for Fool's Gold. You know, arguably the biggest record that I've made, Barbra Streisand, what does that mean, right? It's just, what does Duck Sauce mean? It's just names that sound, it's, it, I hear it and I'm like, yeah, that's the name. It grabs your attention. Yeah, it grabs your attention. Like I remember when we started, so Duck Sauce is a, is a, a group with Armand Van Helden, legendary, um, house DJ, but he and I clicked. We're like 11 years apart. He's older than me. Uh, but he, he, like me, started, grew up in the hip hop scene and then got into house music. And then when I got into electronic music, that was always my approach too. Like, I'm a hip hop kid. I scratch records. Um, I mix fast. If I play a house set, I'm going to mix it like I'm playing hip hop. And I'm going to throw a hip hop vocal over it. So he saw what I was doing around those years and he was like, that guy's like me, but younger. And we started hanging out and, and we started making records and um, we named the group Duck Sauce. And um, 
people would ask us in interviews, why do you call yourselves duck sauce? And we would just say, just to make you ask that question. Or like, why'd you call the song Barbra Streisand? Just to make you ask, why'd you call the song Barbra Streisand? Just to fuck with people a little bit. I mean, here's the thing that's interesting. You know, Fool's Gold turned 10 last year. We're on, we're on our 11th year now. So it's that, um, that, uh, that sort of goalpost, that landmark, um, made me reflect a lot on what it means to have a label for all these years. And it's interesting because the period when we started Fool's Gold was very pivotal for the record industry. And this past year has been very pivotal for the record industry too. On the extremely foundational level, like almost ideological level of like, what does it mean to have a label? What is a record label, right? So we started Fool's Gold in 07 when majors were crumbling, right? Like Napster years, like majors were shitting themselves. And they were, their whole infrastructure was so slow, they weren't even able to keep up with new music that was bubbling. So a big part of the reason why Nick and I started Fool's Gold was that there was so much great music around us, and no one that had any kind of power was doing anything with it, because they didn't even see it yet. But we saw it. We were, we're DJs. We're in the clubs. Yeah. And we trade music with our friends. We know what's happening, and we're like, we're going to take this music and we're going to put it out right. Someone has to do it. And it might seem like it was a challenging year to start a label because everybody was convinced that the record industry was crumbling. But in a way, that's what made it so easy, was that we could do it however way we wanted. And it was the beginning of this huge tide of change where piece by piece, brick by brick, there were no longer gatekeepers, right? So it used to be that you had to have a certain manager. You had to get some sort of deal from a record label. You had to go to some sort of showcase, a CMJ or a South by Southwest kind of thing. Get a lawyer to notice you to shop a deal for you or maybe an A&R. Ever since we started Fool's Gold, all that stuff started changing. And friends could just put out each other's music. And you can get your other friend to do the artwork. And your other friend can route a tour for you. And it was extremely DIY. So we started um, Fool's Gold at, at that point. And for the first year or two, we didn't even, even, we didn't even work with like a traditional distributor. Um, Turntable Lab, the record shop you know, in, in the uh, East Village that also had a great web store that was pressing their own sort of, uh, their own vinyl and, and getting their releases to shops around the world. They acted as our distributor for the first year or two. We were like, we don't even want to go the traditional distributor because they don't even know how to get to the shops where cool kids shop in all these other cities. Our boys are going to get our records. So the, that one good shop in London, that one good shop in Amsterdam, that one good shop in Tokyo. So we just created a network with our friends for, for the first little while and like bootstrapped it and just made it work. Um, but still in those years... Um, you know, streaming didn't exist. Like, all it, blogs were giving away free downloads. A lot of, you know, again, MySpace was prominent. Like, a lot of things were different. The record industry was essentially losing money for a long-ass time, up until a year ago. Last year, there started being articles in the music press saying the record industry as a whole has turned a profit for the first time in, like, literally 15 years. And streaming helped to sort of change, turn that corner. So I think right now there's a, there's a whole new set of questions of what does it mean to be a record label? Why does an artist need a label nowadays? And what's the added value that we provide? And a lot of that is it, it's quality control, it's curation, it's help with content creation. There's so much, there's such a, an incredible mass of music that comes out every week that... Um, presentation and curation is really important and like just the way that you the way that you lay out um your story and your assets and like the context for what your music is as an artist is so important to even get people's attention period people are scro scrolling what's your strategy to present your your you know hard work in a clever way that someone will stop and be like i want to check this out that's what that's a big part of what fool's gold provides and also, Fool's Gold puts you in a community because we do events, because we do art shows at, at our shop and all this other stuff. So it connects a lot of dots. Um, but the, you know, one thing that's been constant through all that time is the importance of remaining nimble 
and malleable. You know, like it, Fool's Gold's always been the kind of company that can adapt itself to any um, a la carte marketing plan that we might make for one artist. Like there's no cookie cutter, right? Like no, no one release is handled the same way as another release. When we bring someone in, we, when we choose to sign an artist, we just activate that part of our brain that goes, okay, what's going to be a clever way to work this record and to get it in front of people's eyes and ears? And we create something from scratch for each artist. So Fool's Gold Day Off, you know, is, is the, probably the most known of a, we have a few kind of franchise of events. Fool's Gold Day Off is the festival. It's the one that happens every year and that has the biggest attendance, biggest stage. It started in New York, 2010, it was a free event. In the, in the loading docks of City Winery, a restaurant in Soho. And we kept it free for as many years as, it, as we could. And then people started crashing the gates and were complaining about long, long lines for the RSVPs. So then we started selling really cheap tickets. And even now, nine years later, the tickets are still $20 for an actual festival. Um, and, you know, it's also expanded to more cities over the years. It went from being just in New York to then New York and L.A. to over the years we've touched Montreal, Miami, Atlanta, um, Paris, London, uh, Austin. Each year we usually choose three or four cities. And, um, and the New York one is still the, the, the cornerstone event of the whole franchise. And we, we handpicked the lineup ourselves. And, um, but even that has changed a lot over the years because for the first few years... We were the only hip hop festival of this new generation. We started Fool's Gold Day Off, I think on the last year that Rock the Bells existed. Rock the Bells, big up to them, but that was another kind of franchise too. But Rock the Bells was still anchored in a, in a sort of classic true school model of, of hip hop and the kinds of artists that they booked. And then our, our big thing was putting new artists on the stage. So a lot of times we would get some sort of headliner that maybe I had a relationship with so we could get him for the homie rate, and, uh, and then get a bunch of up-and-coming artists, pair them up with a few of the Fool's Gold artists, so then you would end up with a show where you had, like, a really cool example of what we would do was, like, the year that we brought Juicy J to New York, which was the year that he put out his mixtapes with Lex Luger, first time he did solo Juicy J projects outside of 3-6 Mafia. And I had met him years ago through some Kanye projects, and Juicy J is the kind of guy that remembers you for years. He's, he stays in touch. So he was starting to put, to put out his, his own records, and I called him up and saying, like, hey, I'm, I'm doing some cool shit in New York, some new stuff, and um, I think our audience would go crazy if you came and perform, and they, everybody's listening to your mixtapes here in New York. And he literally asked me on the phone, like, you think, you think they'll know my, my Juicy J records in New York? Like, are they, are they up on it? Because it was brand new for him to do records outside of 3-6 Mafia. And, um, you know, he wasn't even sure if people were actually listening on the other side of the country. And he, not only did he come through, but he touched down and connected with Rocky and the ASAP guys who were really young. And this is when Space Coast, Space Coast Perp was still kind of in the fold. Yeah, yeah. All those dudes were there on stage with him. On, uh, and then, you know, but we also had Danny Brown who was just on the come up through Fool's Gold as well. And then we would put like Arab music to come up there and do his crazy NPC shows. That's where Arab started performing in front of festival crowds. He kept doing that at more festivals for years after that. Those like, we specialize in connecting dots, right? Between scenes and between generations. I think a lot of the bigger festivals uh, sort of like undervalue the intelligence of the audience. Like I think they dumb down they oversimplify their lineups and their lineups are either a sort of like catch-all plate of every name that exists or it's just one thing. You'll have a festival where it's just quote-unquote SoundCloud rappers or just, you know, boom bap kind of rappers. And we know that, you know, the kids who are consuming hip-hop now who are 19, 20, 21 are actually just as much into, you know, the locks as they are into young bands. You can listen to both. Most people do listen to both. Yeah. Yo, you know what's funny with Jesus last year is um, that was almost a, a that was, a, a, I don't know if I should call it a, a, a coincidence or a happy accident, but if you look on the poster for last year, the host was Dave East, and he was there. But 
there was a scheduling conflict that came up the afternoon of the show. So here's one thing, by the way, if you talk about like lessons or whatever else, is like all this cool DIY shit that, that I'm talking about and that seems awesome, it is awesome, but something goes wrong every time. <laughs> and it's all about half the battle is just knowing how to figure shit out on the fly. Because it's impossible to think that everything will go as planned. So it's all about just knowing how to just bounce. Feet, yeah. yeah, be on your feet all the time. Um, and so, yeah, the afternoon of the show, there was a scheduling conflict with having Dave East host the event. I don't think he realized that this was like a four-hour event because a battle is a certain amount of time, and we have two categories and all this stuff, and he had another commitment. And um, we spoke that day, and I was like, oh, man, like I, I had you as the host. Like, Can we make this work? And he was like, yeah, I also have this other thing I have to go to for the label. I'll come through, but I might not be able to stay the whole time. And I was like, all right, that's, we'll, I'll figure it out. I appreciate you. And um, I had just, like the night before the show, I was sending out my round of texts to people in the city that uh, I thought should see this thing that I worked very hard on putting on. And I had hit Jesus and Merrill the night before. They're friends of ours. They hosted one of the Fool's Gold Day Off events before they got their TV show, like a few years ago. They're just friends of ours. And they were going to come anyways. And when Dave East uh, was not able to stay the whole day, I hit both of them saying, like, guys, I'm, I'm in a jam. I just lost my host. And I can't host this myself the whole night. I'm not very good on the microphone. Uh, and Jesus ended up literally just volunteering, saying, I'll, 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 I'll come in for the save with you. And, um, and yeah, he stayed for as long as we needed him. It was incredible. Um, I mean, everything is moving so fast and in so many directions right now. There's definitely a lot of trends. I'm seeing new trends in the types of deals that people are doing. There's, you know, I was saying that, like, what a label is, that's literally being redefined right now. There's a lot of companies that are changing their types of contracts. Fortunately for Fool's Gold, we've done 50-50 uh, net profit, essentially partnership deals with our artists, artists right from the start. And now it's a lot of majors are starting to do that, talking about it like as if it was some big breakthrough. And I'm sort of like, we've been doing this from the start, guys. But yeah, there's new kinds of car, uh, partnership types, th type contracts that are happening. Um, Genre-wise, musically, one thing that I love with music in general, but even hip hop right now, is that more than ever, there's something for everyone. If you want to hear some lyricist shit, there's plenty of that. If you want to hear some, some just raw energy turn up shit, of course, that, there's that. That's been there for the last couple of years anyways. If you just want to hear some beat shit, there's plenty of that. If you want you know, a new take on the West Coast sound, there's that. If you want some super regional, like, hood Detroit or hood, I don't know, Houston type shit. Listen to this dude, that dude, there's plenty of that. Um, there, you know, there's finally even more acceptance and more presence of a lot of female MCs, rappers, producers too, to the point where I hope people will even start, stop calling someone a female rapper and just be like, hey, there's, yeah, exactly. And it was, you know, there's definitely a conscious decision to put a lot of female artists on the Fool's Gold Day Off lineup this year. Um, so, yeah, I th the point with that is there, there's a lot of everything. There's kind of something for everyone, sonically, genre-wise. Um, and I think in general, the idea of partnership in the bigger picture, just in terms of types of business uh, structures, is, uh, is more and more commonplace. Um, I hope... Uh, I hope the cloud chaser, the cloud chaser thing, will die down a bit because there's definitely a lot of that, and there's a lot of people just trying to be in the cool crowd and trying to be affiliated with this person and that person. I think there's um, there's definitely a level of influence that's that uh, that is inflated, and um, I hope that substance will will you know get more importance from now on because there's going to need to be some sort of readjustment there but I think that's starting to happen and like I think the best way to do that I never knock anyone and anyone who has a certain amount of influence is doing something right and I applaud them um, the best thing I can do is try to 
give more weight to the other side of the balance, right? So Fool's Gold comes from a very authentic place. Any project that I do artistically, musically, music that I'm making myself naturally goes in, in, in that lane because those are my values. Goldie Awards, of course, celebrates skills for producers and DJs. So, you know, if the balance started getting tipped a little too much on the influencer cloud side, I'm not going to try to burst that bubble myself. I'm not throwing rocks on at the balloon, but I'm just trying to bring this side up. <laughs>